couple of years ago, I decided to make a list. The list was an attempt to catalogue every single video game that I could ever remember playing, and then I would give them a score from 1 to 10 based on my enjoyment of them, or based on how much I remembered enjoying them anyway. And then, eventually I decided to turn that into a video. But while I was making that video, I got a bit nostalgic for some of the older games on that list. How much would I enjoy playing some of these older games if I played them today? So I started making another list. A list of games from all over my gaming history that I'd like to play again. And we're going to look at how they've aged, and if they hold up to my standards of today. Some of these games we're going to be looking at are my old favourites. Maybe we'll even take a look at some games I wasn't able to finish as a kid, and I want to see how they ended. Some of these games I can barely remember, and I just kind of want to know what the hell was going on with them. So strap on in, welcome to the Nostalgia Tour. People who know me know that Crash Bandicoot is one of my favourite game series of all time. Sometime in the late 90s, my dad had broken his leg, and he was going to be off his feet for a few weeks while he recovered, so he bought a PlayStation to help pass the time. Can you guess which game he got bundled with it? It was Colin McRae Rally. What can I say, he really likes racing games. But eventually he got Crash Bandicoot, and once we had that game, the PlayStation was no longer his. It was mine. And so started my gaming journey. The original Crash Bandicoot trilogy remains to date my favourite games of all time. And I would probably say that they are the best platformers on the original PlayStation. Period. The first Crash Bandicoot is a very difficult yet very solid game, and it's still my personal favourite, even though you can see they hadn't quite figured everything out yet. Crash 2 is probably the easiest. It's very well balanced when it comes to difficulty. The game actually has a story that isn't Go Save Hot Woman Bandicoot. This one is generally everyone's favourite of the trilogy. The soundtrack is the worst of the bunch though, and don't fucking fight me on this. Crash 3! Well, Crash 3 is a really good game, and it's very good considering it was only made in like 10 months. But it's hard not to see that this one probably could have been better if given a bit more time. But to this day, I still love these games, and the Insane Trilogy remake is perfect. But we aren't here to talk about these games. I already know these ones are good, and I replay them on an almost yearly basis. Today I want to look at Crash Twin Sanity. I rated this game a 9 out of 10 on my I review every game video, but that score is based on how I felt when I last played the game, and that was over 10 years ago. I don't know if it's any good now. I have very fond memories of it though. I remember it being difficult, I remember encountering a few bugs and having to restart the console a couple of times because I was essentially softlocked. I thought the game was pretty funny, and even though I played this game quite a lot back in the day, I only ever beat the final boss once with a friend's help, because it was too hard. So I thought, why not start my nostalgia tour with a game from a series that is not only one of my favourites, but it was my entry to gaming altogether. Crash to Insanity starts off as most games do, with the main menu. There's not much to do, and it kind of looks like poo, and Cortex is stuck in a big ice cube... Shit. Let's just press start. We are greeted with an opening cutscene in which Cortex zaps Coco unconscious, so we can totally convincingly disguise himself as her so he can... well, we'll get to that. For now, we're on an insanity beach, and that chicken just exploded. Also, there's a gem up there. Unlike other Crash games, you do not get gems from collecting boxes in the level, and thank fuck for that. Especially with this game. The gems this time around are just collectibles, and again, unlike other Crash games, they do not give you an ultimate or true ending to the game for collecting them all. They do, however, unlock concept art, animations, and there is a bonus animated skit for collecting them all. The problem is finding them all. I went into this game looking to collect them all, and I decided to give up on the first level when I realised I was near the end of it and was missing one. And I couldn't go back and get it, wherever it was. So I just settled with collecting whichever ones I found, and then I gave up on that when I realised some of these puzzles are just absolute bullshit. The other problem is, the little hub areas with the puzzles are usually split up over the course of multiple levels. So the first hub's gems for Insanity Island are split up over four different areas, which you would absolutely not know if you were playing this game for the first time, especially without a walkthrough. Anyway, if we walk along the beach for a little bit, Aku Aku shows up and tells me how he works. Is I, Aku Aku. And he works the same way he has for the past 10 years. Except for when he inexplicably decided to stop protecting us from Nitro Crates when we entered the PlayStation 2 era. This little cutscene here is also unskippable. Oh well. So I'm gonna go grab this gem by running some chickens into an explosives and... Whoops! Oh well. We still have three lives left and we don't have to recollect that gem. 
which is nice, but oh. It is I, Aku Aku. Oh. So here we are with our first big problem, the unskippable cutscenes. See, unskippable cutscenes are okay if it's like five to 10 seconds long. I'm not bothered. But watching unskippable cutscenes multiple times is, well, it's annoying. Especially if I'm going around doing dangerous puzzles in the game that could require me dying more than once. And maybe now's a good time to mention that this game is just straight up unfinished. The game is buggy as hell. There was cut content, missing sound effects, and just absolutely strange design decisions. It's interesting to see as like gaming has gone on. The games like these could have been fixed in a patch, but back then when we bought a game, we got what we got. For better or in this case, worse, I guess. <laughs> I should probably move on because I have not left the beach yet. And there are a million parrots flying around and they've gotten bored, they've left, and they've started eating all the apples off my fucking apple tree. Leave it alone. The first actual level of this game is a tutorial level where we watch Cortex do something and proceed to just do it ourselves. It's fine. Cortex is cracking jokes and there's a few fun gags here and there. It does the job for a first level. It's a bit weird though because all of the stuff that he's teaching us we needed to collect the gems in the first little hub area. Eventually we get to the end of the level and Cortex reveals himself to Crash. He's led us into a trap and he's invited all of our past enemies to a birthday party. Also I love how Crunch actually thought it was a party. That's such a good character moment. The thing I love about this game is it understands the tone of the Crash franchise. Probably better than any other Crash game in the series. Hey, hey, hey! Yeah, you! I've been doing this for 10 stinking years! Back and forward, back and forward, and I'm sick of it! Well, I'm not gonna do it no more! It's jokey and fun, and it just doesn't take itself seriously at all. Anyway, we spin back some balls with Cortex, and then a second boss comes out. While it's pretty cool in design, it's a cakewalk. We're thrown with Cortex into a hole where he tackles us down another hole, and we're controlling Crash and Cortex having a Looney Tunes-esque fight down a tunnel. And I just love how absurd this is. But this part of the game kinda sucks. The controls are like really weighty, which would be fine, but the level design doesn't really accommodate for it. Before long, we hit the bottom and find a crystal. Cortex gets yeeted by an alien drill and now we have to fight Ant-Man. Yeah. So things just kind of happen in this game. The good thing about this game is that there aren't really any lull periods at all. No part or level in this game really lasts more than, let's say, 20 minutes. The problem comes with the story and once again, things just kind of happen. There is really no rhyme or reason to anything going on. Uh, the story just seems barely stitched together, but luckily the wacky kind of nature of the game's tone masks that a little bit. But everything just kind of happens at breakneck speed. In the first hour alone, Cortex dresses up in drag to trick us into a trap. We fight a mech boss, we roll around in the cave, fight ant people who come from a giant drill, team up with Cortex to get out of the cave, run from the giant drill, meet the main antagonist of the story, these pinky in the brain ripoffs from another dimension threaten to destroy the world, rip Cortex's brain out, we catch up to Cortex, then he gets chased away by bees, then kidnapped by Papu Papu. We go through a stealth section, we rescue him, get chased by the native, and meet back up with the twins who summon a tiki monster boss to fight. Oh, and Cortex shot a farmer somewhere in there too. Oh, Crash. The farmer's market is tomorrow, and my wampa trees won't grow, for my orchard is riddled with greedy worms. If you rid my land of these pests, I'll give you this power crystal. At least we fixed his farm's worm problem for his next of kin. Anyway, after beating the tiki boss, who has like so many missing sound effects. Cortex thinks up of a plan, but we need to go to his evil ice lair. So we hop on this boat that's being driven by this mystery text box and off we go to the second level of the game. Now, technically it's probably the fifth level, but as a whole, the first island, it's pretty fun. So we find ourselves at the bottom of this snowy iceberg lace. As we move up the path we find Cortex is waiting for us at the base of, well, his base. And just quickly I want to talk about the voice acting in this game. This is the first Crash game to feature Lex Lang as Dr. Neo Cortex, who is taking over the role from Mr. Krabs himself, Clancy Brown. Clancy had been voicing Cortex since Crash 2, I believe. And no offence to Clancy Brown, but Lex is the definitive Dr. Neo Cortex. Prize to see me, Crash. Like the fleas in your fur, I keep coming back. 
three years I spent alone in the frozen Antarctic wastes. And he really has the time to shine in this game, as like 80% of the lines in this game are spoken by Cortex. So it's a good thing Lex kills it in this role, otherwise this game, it would have been so much worse off. Anyways, Cortex tries to open the front door to his base, but it doesn't work, so to go the long way around. Uh, this part is fine, there's some decent crash platforming. The bats are kind of annoying. We get about halfway up and we get another cutscene with Cortex. Cortex refuses to pay his workers a proper wage. Check bounced. Are you sure? Well, the past few years have kind of been slow. Wrath of Cortex didn't do as well as we'd hoped, and... Fish? And we keep going. And this is another Cortex and Crash twin level. I don't think I talked about these before. They're fine. The controls are a bit clunky, but I think that's mostly by design. I think. One of the biggest problems is trying to precision throw Cortex anywhere. Um, it's not a problem for most of the game, but if you're going for the gems, it is. It is really hard to gauge where he's going to go. <laughs> Eventually we find Uka Uka and we have a boss fight and it's a joke. Not by design. It's way too easy. It's, it's so dumb. Eventually we make it to the top and into Cortex's base and we're ambushed by Ant-Man. The twins come back and say some shit. Cortex tells us he has a plan, but we need two more crystals. Oh, we've been collecting crystals, apparently. So off we go to get two more crystals that would apparently be on Engine's battleship. But how do we get there? There, to the sea, I tell you. Our salvation floats upon the briny blue. We must reach Engine's battleship and quickly before it sets sail. But how? Think, Cortex, think. Well, Crash has an idea. Honestly, this is a really fun part of the game, but right now I really want to talk about the music in Twin Sanity. The soundtrack to this game is all a cappella, which means there's no instruments used at all, it is all voice work. And I love how creative the soundtrack is. And they do a fantastic job of capturing the tone of the game and rising to the occasion of the game's various set pieces. Now, there's probably a lot of post-processing done, especially with the way the voices are mixed and stuff, but but it is very impressively done, the entire thing. Anyway, surfing down a mountain on Cortex's face, what a brilliant set piece. After that's all done, we get one of the most unfinished cutscenes ever put to gaming. Never been so humiliated. No amount of treasure could ever begin to compensate. Treasure, eh? Fonza. Like, what even is this? After that, we go into the battleship, which is a very unremarkable level. So I'm just gonna skip over it. The boss fight of Engine is also just a joke as well. It's pretty shit. After we beat him, though, we fall down through a roof and we have to run from a walrus. Uh, once again, things just happen in this game. Like, this is a typical Boulder Run, like, level, but we're running from a walrus that wants to eat us, and I don't know where he came from. At the end of the level, though, we run out into a bunch of TNT, it explodes, and we end up on a random iceberg where Entropy and Embryo are waiting for us. And once again, things just happen in this game. Like, Dingle Dial before in that random cutscene mentions treasure, or something, and that tips everybody off towards the treasure, but we never saw... I don't know. It's, it's just, I don't know. This fight is also just fairly easy, if you know how it's done. Just run away from Embryo, and when Tropy comes out, stand next to this crack in the iceberg. Because there is really no other way to telegraph or react to where the iceberg splits, it just splits and you get cheesed. Back at the lab, Cortex begins to start up the Psychotron before Coco reappears and kicks him in the nads and breaks the machine. To fix the machine, we're going to have to go on another detour to find Cortex's niece, Nina, to fix the machine. She's at the Academy of Evil, so we go off in Cortex's airship, which is a great Crash 1 callback, by the way, and we get another cutscene where the twins taunt Cortex. These FMV cutscenes are actually really decently animated. Once again, it's another thing that elevates what would be normally, like, a very mediocre game. <laughs> and speaking of mediocre, we're now just controlling Cortex, I guess. This is just a little tutorial. Once again, it just kind of happens. Um, we just shoot some ant dudes and then 30 seconds later we're crash again at the Academy of Evil. 
In this help level, I decided to play around with some of the puzzles and try and get some of the gems here. And as you can see, I'm having a bit of a trouble with it. Um, and yeah, there are some pretty cool physics here, especially for when the game was released. The biggest trouble is how Crash interacts with those, especially these, like these soccer balls, if they're impossible. It's just straight jank. And I wouldn't be normally worried about that kind of thing because it's optional, but it actually isn't. Because the story takes us into the sewer and Cortex falls into a pipe and now those weird physics are now attached to Cortex. And if we screw up here, we don't have an infinitely respawning soccer ball, we lose a life. Luckily, like many things in this game, it doesn't last that long. After doing a few of those puzzles, accidentally killing Cortex and doing some of those puzzles again, we get an actual decent boss fight. For the fight, Cortex gets yeeted again and Dingo Dial is here. No, I don't know why he's in the sewer of an evil school. No, I don't know how he got here or how he knew we were going to be here. And Dingo Dial's boss fight is very similar to his old Crash 3 boss fight, except you can't cheese it. <laughs> and yeah, I do like how difficult this fight is, even if it is a little bit bullshit. And it is mostly pattern learning. After beating Dingo Dial, we have to do a stealth section that mirrors the one from earlier with the tribal people and it's... yeah. We also have to run up a library filling with acid, which also mirrors that drill we ran away from earlier. Anywho, wait, did we just collect another crystal? Why? They aren't even relevant to the plot anymore. We catch up with Cortex or, well, he catches up with us. He tells Crash to bugger off and go check if the airship is secure. Well, he takes it from here. So we're Cortex again. And like I said before, weird design decisions. And the Cortex level thankfully only lasts for about 10 minutes because it's easily the worst in the game. He just controls really terribly. The gameplay just isn't fun. And at the end of the level we reach Nina. With its long claws that scratch and its sharp teeth that bite. Under the covers there's no need to hide. For your uncle's a monster and he's on your side. <laughs> and then we get to play as Nina. And holy shit thank god because so far, the Academy of Evil stuff has been really bad, and this level is very great. The music, the level design, and the controls, they're all pretty good here. Also, Crash decided to tie the airship to a school bus, which leads to one of the most creative boulder chase segments in Crash history. <laughs> That's also really funny. <laughs> that was really fun. I liked that level. And once again, it doesn't last very long. Oh, and we're Cortex again. Oh, we've got a boss fight. This kind of reminds me of one of my teachers from primary school. Anyway, I knocked this boss out in one go. No problem. So let's get the hell out of here and... Shit. Shit! What is this checkpoint? Why am I all the way back here? Well, I may have knocked it out in one go, but I certainly didn't the next two times. So after a 10 minute detour, let's get the hell out of here. For real this time. We get back to the lair, Cortex and Nita fix the machine, and we head off to the 10th dimension. And we get another cutscene where Nina is kidnapped by a fake crash. And after we get a placeholder line from Cortex, we follow them up the mountain and... Hang on, this is a bit familiar. Obviously there's the callback cutscene there, but... I actually just need to go back and check the footage on this one. Is this the same level as before, but repeated? It's a normal thing in a crash game to do the same idea more than once. And do a more difficult version later on. This happens with the rising drill acid thing, the stealth sections, and the bees slash evil crash sections of the game. And this happens in earlier crash games before all the time. But this one just feels a bit too derivative, even if the level isn't quite the same. Anywho, we end up saving Nina and we do another B section, but it's Cortex running away from evil crash, but not really because evil crash got stuck at the start of the level. And like I said before, it's the same thing as before, but just a little bit harder. And we have an open world beach area with a few jumper puzzles that are absolute bullshit, so I skipped them. We find the twins evil lair and we head inside. And this level, this level is easily my favourite of the game. It is easily the most solidly designed level from start to finish. The open cavern's design means the camera is a little less screwy than usual. I'm not sure if I talked about this, but the camera in this game fucking sucks. There is a really cool platforming puzzle that's rhythm and memory based. Spinning the ant enemies off the edge of the map is really, really satisfying. The music is really on point. The art and the style of the level is also just awesome. And I really don't know why this is the level that's the most polished of the entire game, but I'm glad it really is. And unfortunately, and sing along if you know the words, like many things in this game, it doesn't last that long. We get to the end and we're greeted by a giant treasure room with some of the bosses from before to shank us and, and take it for themselves. Spyro the dragon showed up 
and just murdered these assholes in cold blood while Cortex breaks the fourth wall. Anyway, final boss time. It is time to face off against the twins. Uh, Cortex shits a brick and Crash just full on bolts, so Nina has to step up. So her part of the boss fight is really easy once you know what to do. Just wall jump up these silos and smash these light bulb things, and if you're quick enough you don't actually have to worry about any boss mechanics at all. If you're a bit slower you will have to fight some of these ant dudes at the bottom, but they can be ignored most of the time. Once Nina is done, it's Cortex's time to shine. Also, I do love this little moment where Cortex does decide to step up and protect his niece. Just a tiny little nice character moment. Now remember earlier when I said I was never able to beat this game as a kid? This part is why. Hell, I even had trouble doing it this time around. As Cortex, you need to shoot the guns off the twins' mech while dodging its attacks. And well, if you lose, you need to do the Nina part again. Is this the Dark Souls of Crash Bandicoot boss fight? No. It's really hard though. Oh, so I thought. I figured out every time I tried to do this boss, I would always run to the left. And guess what? The fight is much easier if you just run to the right instead. I don't know how nine year old me couldn't figure this one out. So taking out the beam cannon first and then trying to dodge and shoot the machine gun arm is the way to go. And now we have the final part of the boss fight. Crash is back and he has the bandicoot mech. And don't ask me how he got it here. I get, the moment is cooler than the boss fight itself because this is very underwhelming. <laughs> You just run to the right and shoot through the barrier and the thing is dead. It's kind of crazy because the Bandicoot mech has rockets, machine gun and that little charge up plasma ball attack from the first fight. The fight doesn't really require us to know any of that. You just press buttons and it shoots something and fires an attack. With the mech defeated, the twins escape and we get an end cutscene where they find themselves in Evil Crash's house and they're eaten alive. Wow, well, alright. Back at Cortex's lair, Cortex tries to backstab Crash and yeet him away to another dimension only for the machine to just explode and Cortex is transported into Crash's mind. And that is Crash Twin Sanity. So after everything is said and done, is this game as good as I remember? No, <laughs> absolutely not. Holy hell, this game is so rough. Although I still really like it despite its flaws. So I'll be dropping my original score of a 9 down to a 7. And I feel like that still might be a bit generous, but I do really love what they were going for in this game. And I'll always look more favourably on a game trying to do something new and exciting, like this one, than a game that plays it too safe and ends up boring like Wrath of Cortex. I think the biggest shame about Twin Sanity is that I can see the potential this game could be. This game could have been one of the best platformers of this console's generation. Hell, it could have been one of the best Crash games of all time if it were finished. The only thing I can hope for is that someday it gets the remake it deserves. And this game deserves to be finished. I'm not sure what Activision is doing with the Crash series after their live service Crash game dies, but I'm hoping that they just put some time away and remake Crash Twin Sanity. Actually, you know what, just for fun, here is what I would like to see done if I were in charge of a Crash Twin Sanity remake. First off, I wouldn't change the story too much, but I would make sure there are some extra like story threads here and there, so it's overall the story is just a bit more cohesive. I'd definitely like to see more levels. There was this very infamous cut level from the game called Gone A Bit Coco that took place inside Coco's mind after she gets paralysed. I definitely would have had a second Nina level put in the game as well as the second Cortex only level. I would slightly rework how Cortex would play though. I'd remove strafing because who even used that? And give him the ability to switch targets when shooting and put those on the strafing buttons. <laughs> I'd also make it so when he moves around, he's always trying to target an enemy. And he does this at the moment, but I'd make it so if he's running backwards, he'd be able to shoot forwards kind of thing. Like he's always trying to target no matter which direction the enemy is in and which way he's running. I'd also give all the characters that little yellow circle from Crash 4 that helps with the platforming. You don't need a working camera when you can just see where you're going to land all the time. That little circle is the biggest quality of life improvement the Crash series has had <laughs> ever. And if we have unlimited time and budget to do this game, I'd also expand and put a couple of Coco levels in there as well and give her a parallel story to the main one. And it, you could even use it to help expand on why some things in the story happen. For example, when Mech Crash shows up at the end of the game, have her be the one who brings it in. You can still have it be a surprise, but you know, that way you know where it came from, I guess. I'd also give Nina some actual voice lines in the game. She doesn't talk the entire game, so that way Cortex has another character to bounce off of in cutscenes. Because honestly, Cortex's performance is so good, I'd love for him to actually have more things to say. The biggest thing though that I would want to do is I'd rework all the levels in the game 
so that they could flow through a central hub for easier replayability. This is already kind of prevalent in the game, but it's not obvious. For example, in the Academy of Evil, when you exit the sewer section, you're back in the main courtyard from the start, and you can re-enter the sewer if you choose. Or you can keep going into the stealth section, which is a door that opened that wasn't open before, which does end up leading into the Cortex and Nina section as well. What I would want to do though is make it so each individual level could lead in and out of the main hub area. And I know I'm just starting to describe like a normal crash game, but I would keep the linear storied version of how the game currently runs, but at the end you can just replay that one single section from the main hub. And it would make it so much easier and less tedious to do all the collectathon stuff if you only have to replay a single level instead of multiple levels just to collect, you know, one gem that you missed. I would also make it so these hub areas are easier to travel to and from, and also add some more gem puzzles. And I'll probably make it so certain characters can only do certain puzzles, so we can play around with the other characters a bit more and have more time with them. Alright, I guess that's it. Crash Twin Sanity is a flawed game, but it was absolutely made with love and care for the character and franchise it was made for. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked this video, please consider leaving this video a like, and if you're new, subscribing. Next up on the Nostalgia Tour, we're going to be looking at another PlayStation 2 platformer, this time helped by a certain yellow mascot with a hunger for fruits, pellets, and ghosts. We'll catch you next time.